The interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. The veteran's name is Vern Douglas Phillips. They were born on, born on March 14, 1928. He served in the Navy during World War II, Vietnam, and Korea. He achieved the rank of Chief Petty Officer, and we are recording this on April 5, 2013. I am William Richter, and I'm conducting the interview. No relation. So thank you, Doug, for uh, taking the time to interview with us. My um, pleasure. We're really looking <clears throat> forward to this. Um, so let's start off with um, uh, where and when you were born. Well, I was born in Glendale, California, in, on March 14, 1928. Yeah. Okay. And um, so uh, let's talk about your, your parents. Um, what did your, your mom and dad do? Um, how many um, siblings did you have, if any? Well, I have one, one sibling, a sister that's five years younger than me. Okay. Uh, my father was born on a farm in Iowa. My mother was born in Virginia. They met in Los Angeles. And that's where they got married, it was in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, what, what did your, your, your dad do? What was his, his job? He was a mechanic. A mechanic? Okay. And um, so talk about high school. What were you doing before the service? Um, I know this was getting into the World War II time. Uh, can you touch on that a little bit? Well, it's kind of interesting because a, a group of kids that I ran around with, I was the youngest of the group of mm -hmm. about six or seven. And most people don't realize what it was like back in World War II. People, for the most part, wanted to go into the service. It wasn't this bit of running off someplace and hiding and avoiding the draft. There were a yeah. few that did that. but. Uh, we were quite patriotic back in those days. Mm -hmm. And all of my friends had been put into the service. Some enlisted and some were drafted. And I was in 11th grade and they were all gone, so I quit and joined the Navy. Very cool. And um, did you have any other family members that served in the military? No. No? Well, my father in World War I. But in World War I, wow. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, so, uh, why did you choose the Navy? What made you choose the Navy versus the Army or uh, any other branch? I really don't know, except that most of my friends that went in were in the Navy. Okay. Um, so, so, what was like when you first left for, for training camp and uh, your life in, in training? And you mean besides being scary? Besides being <laughs> scary, yes sir. <laughs> well, of course you go to boot camp, and boot camp is quite a, quite a shock because they try to take the civilian out of you real quick and make mm -hmm. you military. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> my boot camp was in San Diego, California, at the okay. Naval Training Center. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and from there, uh, I was transferred to Hawaii. And I had a reasonably high GCT score. And what, and what was that? Called General Classification Test. Okay. And uh, while I was waiting to, in the barracks to go to school one day, they called out six of us mm -hmm. and said, you're going to go to weather observing school. And none of us had any idea what that was. Okay. Never heard of it. <laughs> and so we went to uh, <clears throat> called the Fleet Weather Central in Hawaii, where they had what's called a Class A school. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to take weather observations and and you know how to release weather balloons and all this yeah. type of thing. And then from I was stationed there for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. You want me to keep going? Yeah, yeah. And, and what was, tell, tell us about, um, what was a, an average day like for you um, in, in training? Uh, what was it well, like? When you're in training, training, when you're yeah. in boot camp, you'd, <laughs> the average day is you do everything that somebody tells you to do. <laughs> do more? <laughs> <laughs> you don't hardly do anything on your own there. Yeah. They tell you when to get up, when to go yeah. to bed. They march you to to the mess halls, and mm -hmm. so 
<laughs> yeah, what was the food like? Um, the, oh. Yeah, living quarters and everything. Well, the living quarters, of course, you're in the barracks. Mm -hmm. You know, two pretty. tiered bunks and all of this type of thing. So it's pretty crowded when you're yeah. quite a shock for civilian to also be thrown in with mm -hmm. 50 or 100 other guys all in this one long room. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but the basic training was, was interesting, but it was, you know, you had to learn how to march amongst other things and, and how to conduct yourself as a military person. Mm -hmm. And the basic thing they told us there, if, if it moves, salute it, and if it doesn't move, paint it. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very simple instructions at first. Definitely. Uh, so did you have time for like recreation and social life? What were your, did you have friends there? Well, not on basic training, you didn't have much time for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You did get to go to the movies and this type of thing, but... Not very often? No, you were... They scheduled you for a haircut every week, mm -hmm. whether you needed it or not. Oh, wow. You know. Okay, so, um, let's... Uh, so you, you were in, in the weather forecasting school, the no, weather, observing, weather, observing school. weather observing school. And uh, from there, uh, myself and then two other people mm -hmm. were flown to Kwajalein because that, that was, there was an A-bomb test called Operation Crossroad. Okay. Which was done at, uh, at Bikini Atoll. Okay. And I was stationed on a weather ship, and weather ships were a ship that had three to four weather observers on it, uh -huh. and that's all that that ship was for, was a weather ship, and they were called, you would go out and sit in a certain spot of the ocean, they were called bird dog stations, mm -hmm. you'd go out there and sit there for a month, and because they were getting ready to do these tests, they, they needed some more people out there, so yeah. we, I was sent out there for that night. I served on, I think, four different weather ships over a period of several months. Mm -hmm. So did you, um, what was your experience with the, the testing? Did you get to see any of that? Or no, you're experience? too far away. Too far away? Yeah. Okay. So so your job was to to see like the effects of the, the well, tests? Yeah, well, what was taking uh, weather observations. Mm -hmm. And we had a, I think it's the place we had that. We had something that was like a piece of scotch tape mm -hmm. and stuff that would fall out of the atmosphere and that these were folded up and sent it in every day. Wow. So, so it would almost rain, rain down debris? From well, the, I guess that's what they were checking on. Yeah. They never told us. We just, they said do just it. Did, <laughs> did what you did? Okay. Um, so, so after that, um, we're... Where did you go? Well, I went from from the uh, weather ships. I went to the Fleet Weather Central in Guam for a couple of, couple of months, and then I went to the Carolyn Islands to open up a weather station mm -hmm. on one of the islands called Ponape. Okay, tell us about I that. I was there for about a year, and went down there and took all my equipment with me and, and opened up a weather station. That's really cool, and um, and so was this what about was this towards the end of World War Two? Uh, wh where are we here? I went to Pompeii the last, I think it was in December forty six. Okay. Either November or December forty six, and uh, I stayed there for one year, uh -huh. and then see when I joined the Navy. You didn't join for specifically for a period of time. Mm -hmm. It said you signed up for the duration or two years. <laughs> okay. If if there wasn't any fighting going on at the end of two years, you could get discharged. Right. But you signed up for the duration, so if the war would have lasted ten years, you'd have stayed. Stay in. You're in for the duration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so so where did you go after after that base? Where did you? Well, I came back and I uh, took my took my discharge after the war. Okay. And I uh, 
you use the term after the war a couple of times. That's one thing I should make it clear yeah. that <clears throat> the peace was signed in 1945. Okay. Okay. But hostilities weren't over until somewhere around September or something like that of 46. Mm -hmm. And while I was on Guam, every night there were fight there was fighting in the hills and stuff, cleaning out the residual Japanese that were holding out. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it sounds kind of funny to say, well, the war ended, but didn't it? Well, it did, but the fighting didn't. Kept, the fighting kept going. Yeah. They, was that because they hadn't gotten word or just no, that they were safe, them, taking their last stand? Some of them didn't want to give up. Okay. In fact, I think some of them held out until, until the 70s or something like that. Wow. I, I don't remember exactly right, when, but right. I know there was a, sure. some that held out for a long time. Sure. But anyhow, from when I left Bonapay and came back to the States, I took my discharge and then I went into the uh, reserve mm -hmm. and it was a training reserve where that you went one day a month or one weekend a month mm -hmm. and two weekends a year. And I did that for probably about two years and the Korean War started up and I got called back in. Okay. So when you when you went back into the, with the Korean War, um, did you did you have to go through any training again, or did they ship no. you straight over? No. Uh, matter of fact, I was stationed at, at a naval air station in, uh, near Long Beach, California, okay. called Los Alamitos. Okay. And I was there for probably two years. Okay. No, hope nobody's keeping track of the times I'm putting. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Really be off. And from there, I was transferred to the uh, USS Yorktown, which is a oh wow a carrier. Have you ever been to? Uh, yeah, I've been to the Yorktown. It's, yeah, it's pretty okay. cool. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that that's the ship I was. <clears throat> I went up to Seattle and was on there when it was recommissioned. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the original commissioning, but it had been decommissioned and it went overhaul. Right. And I was on it when it was recommissioned. Right. And what was life like on the ship? What what did what did you go through? Life on an aircraft carrier is very busy yeah. for some people. Now the weather observers on an aircraft carrier I don't know where the weather office is on the modern carriers, mm -hmm. but on all of the Essex class carriers, the weather office was two levels above the bridge. Okay. And, <clears throat> and so we took all of our, you know, weather observations are run on Greenwich time. Okay. And observations are done on a regular basis. There are special things that are done every six hours, some are done every 12 hours. Okay. And all of those things are done on Greenwich time so that they're done at the same time throughout the world. Right. So Keith. it doesn't make any difference what local time you're going by. We went by Greenwich time. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I was several months on the Yorktown, and then I got transferred to a transport ship. Mm -hmm. Or I was the only weather observer on the transport ship. And so they were really rather, counting on you, huh? Rather, rather interesting to be a, in the Navy if, if you're part of the air branch, you're called an Airedale. Okay. And so I was the only Airedale rate on on the ship. So. So so what did that designation mean? What did what did you? Well, do? no, it just means. Well. Uh, I don't know exactly how to word it, but okay. it. when you're in Airedale, you're in the air branch of the, of the okay. Navy. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and when, back in those days, most, except for fighter planes, most planes had uh, enlisted crew on them also. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they don't. You have a pilot, sometimes they have a radar man or something like that, mm -hmm. but they're, they're both officers and, and that's it. But, but when, when I was at Los Alamitos, I was in the TBM squadron, squadron and even though I was a weather observer, mm -hmm. because that's what the squadron had to fly with the squadron, I was a, I was a gunner on a TBM. 
Okay. And so we had the pilot and two enlisted men on, a, on the plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was rather interesting. But yeah. So talk about that. Um, when you did you did you ever um, get in a battle with any other uh, any other enemy planes? No. Anything like that? No, not during that time. The only time that I ever had any hostilities towards me, and it wasn't towards me, it was towards the plane I was in. Mm -hmm. When I was in Guam at the Fleet Weather Central there, mm -hmm. they had a uh, group called a torpedo, of the Typhoon Chasers. Okay. You still have them here. Yeah. River hurricane along the coast. They send out somebody in an airplane to see what's going on. Okay. Well, they had them there in Guam. And they were the old Liberators, the big four-engine bomber converted as an observing plane. Okay. And <clears throat> uh, when I was there, the Marianas Islands, we didn't ca capture all the Marianas Islands. We just took the ones that we wanted and used those. And we just left the others there. The Japanese were still on it. And when we flew over one of them, they were shooting at us. So that's the only time I was wow. ever shot. At. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that wasn't too exciting because yeah. we, we were probably about five or six thousand feet as we flew over the island. But you could look down and see the flashes of light yeah. from from the gun. You know, and they never heard of any of these planes ever get being hit by these guys. They mm -hmm. must have been awful poor shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that yeah. was the only only time in the military that I was ever mm -hmm. shot at. Yeah, that that's really. Uh great that you made it out. <laughs> um, so, so tell us about, um, you know, any, any friends that you had, um, going for, I know when you, you said you bounced around different ships, um, every so often, uh, did you have any, any friends that you kept in contact with regularly? Um, did you keep in touch with people back home? Well, the, uh, Weather service in the Navy is a rather small unit. Mm -hmm. And we did keep track with each other. Mm -hmm. For example, we had Christmas cards. And so you take pictures and, and everybody's name would be on there. And it was sent to every other weather office. And so every Christmas you get a card from every weather office. And you say, oh, Charles is there. Oh, look, he's there. <laughs> You know, you keep track of everybody that way. But since I've got out of the Navy, uh, there was only one person I've kept fair contract, uh, contact with. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't even the weather service. He was a hard hat diver in Hawaii. Oh, wow. And he and I were very close friends over there. And uh, we talked maybe once every two years or something mm -hmm. like that kind of keep up, you know, see something on Facebook or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, going in, um, you know, we were talking about Korea, um, going forward from there, um, with, with, you served in Vietnam yeah. during that time, what was that well, like? Well, to, to let you know what happened with Korea, mm -hmm. when I was on the transport ship, it was right at the, really the height of the Korean War activity. Mm -hmm. And on this transport ship, we would spend three days in Yokohama and four days in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of the time we're going back and forth, back and forth with troops, taking them over, mm -hmm. bringing back troops, and taking supplies and this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And in that, I think on a 14-month period of time, we went about 220 or 30,000 miles. Wow. At 18 miles an hour. <laughs> it's like riding a bike all yeah. across the ocean almost, huh? And, uh, <laughs> one, one of the trips we went over there, we went into Incheon mm -hmm. with supplies and troops. And so that was the only time I was on Korean soil itself. Mm -hmm. And, and what were the troops like um, coming over uh, to Korea and, and coming back home? What was their, what was the, the mindset there? What were, what were their emotions, that kind of thing? Most of them had very positive things. 
I'm going to say something, I hope that whoever's going to watch this tape <laughs> sure. here's what I have to say. Sure. You know, there's a lot of things that happen with troops coming back nowadays and they're talking about, you know, PTSD. Ha ha having all of the problems that they're having. And I think one of the reasons for that is because there's such a sharp, immediate change. Back in World War II, in Korea and all of that, mm -hmm. you'd be in a combat zone. Before you came back to the States, you'd go to a receiving station mm -hmm. and you had to wait for transportation to go back so you might be there for two weeks to two months. Mm -hmm. And then you'd get on a ship and if you're over in Japan or uh, Guam or someplace like that, you just didn't hop on a plane and right. get off six hours later at home. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they got back to the United States, they had gone through a transition period. Okay. You know, so they got to reacclimate. A cooling them. off period, yeah. you know, a time of rest and all of that. Yeah. And I, I personally think that one of the reasons why that things are the way they are now, because you can be fighting, okay, your time to go home, so you pack up your bag and you hop on a big transport plane mm -hmm. and you land in uh, Dover Air Force Base or something like that, and you walk off near your back to the States. Just right? thrown back into it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just think that that is... Not the, not the way of doing it. I don't know if you've ever seen a series called Victory at Sea. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of that? Yeah. It was a, uh, and one of the episodes on there uh -huh. was showing everybody coming home. Mm -hmm. And you could see them just lounging around and yeah. laying out in the sun and, and you know, getting used to not being in combat. So I said my piece. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. So, um, so continuing on with uh, Korea, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with Korea? Uh, your service? No, there? it was like I said. The only time I was actually in Korea was when mm -hmm. we were in Incheon, and the fighting was about seven or eight miles away from where we were. So, what what were the people like there? Did you get to interact with any of the locals no, there? No, no strictly in the base. That, no, that was not at that time. No. Okay, okay. So, so going forward, what it what did you do after Korea? Let's see, from there, I went on to a, a jeep carrier. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of, talk about one of those, those carriers, what's that like? Well, in World War II, they had the full-size carriers, mm -hmm. and they had the little auxiliary carriers. Okay. And they were basically a big cargo ship that put a flight deck on it. I mean, there is more than that, but sure. they, they were sure. called Jeep carriers. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> I think this was in somewhere around that time. Yeah, it was sure. in, in the mid-50s. Yeah. And uh, we took a load of supplies and old airplanes that I guess the United States didn't want mm -hmm. into what was called French Indochina at the time. Okay. And believe it or not, they took this carrier up the river and we docked in Saigon. Now Saigon is wow. way inland, yeah. but we took an aircraft carrier. Took an aircraft <laughs> carrier up a which, river. Which that, that in itself was quite a <laughs> quite an exciting excursion. Talk about up threading there. a needle, huh? And, <clears throat> And this is before the United States was involved. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, the French Foreign Legion were the ones doing the fighting. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we saw, they all looked like German soldiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably where all of the ex-German soldiers went. Yeah. Were the French Foreign Legion. Sure. Uh, but we spent, I think it was four or five days there. Saigon at that time was a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. It was called the Paris of the Orient. Really? And it had a big wide boulevard down the middle of it like Paris has. Uh -huh. I've seen pictures. The shops. Yeah. The shops of the city. And they had the exact same thing like that. There was the restaurants along the side uh -huh. and grass and trees in the middle and all of that. And it was really a beautiful city and we enjoyed our stay there. Uh -huh. 
uh, it could be a little bit dangerous there because there are a couple of guys on the ship. I was fortunate I wasn't one of them, but some were shot at. Oh, okay. Wow. As they were walking the street, and you know, one of them was in a rickshaw when he was shot at. <laughs> <laughs> and the rickshaw driver really took off. So I bet. <laughs> <laughs> And when we had the shore patrol parties go out, there was, it was half French and half American mm -hmm. together in a party. So <clears throat> that, that was my stint of actually being in, mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Okay. And, uh, and so, so going, going home after that, what was that like? Did, um, well, after, after being in, uh, on that ship, uh, I requested to go to forecasting school, which is in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Okay. And um, I attended that. Okay. Did, uh, a five and a half month school. And <clears throat> and after you graduated from that school, then you you were designated as a weather forecaster because that's what it was. Mm -hmm. It was a forecasting school. And <clears throat> from there, I went to. Naval Air Station Miramar, which is just north of San Diego, mm -hmm. and did my two, two and a half years there. And from there, I was transferred to Naval Air Station Barbers Point, but I only stayed there for a month because they, were, they had too many weather people there. Mm -hmm. So I was transferred to <coughs> Fleet Weather Central Pearl. And it was while I was in Pearl, at the Fleet Weather Center in Pearl, that I made Chief Petty Officer. And one of the interesting jobs I had there mm -hmm. was the, I was a weather briefer for the big war room in Hawaii. I did, wow. that. I did that for almost three years. I got a year's extension uh -huh. while I was there to do that. So, so what was the, the dynamic in, in the war room? What was that like? Um, with did you have generals and, and admirals and everyone in well, there? Well, that's about all I say, yes, it's, it's, it's the war room. Yeah, okay. And okay. The only thing I can say about it is that at the briefing every morning, there, I was facing 23 stars. Wow, wow. So yes, there were, there was a sink pack war room. Okay. St. Pac stands for Commander in Chief Pacific. Uh -huh. There's this one in the Atlantic called St. Lamp. Okay. And there's one in the Pacific called St. Pac. And that person there, the St. Pac, is the overall commander of all military, whether it's Air Force, Marines, the Army, or whatever. Uh -huh. He's the one that's in charge of the Pacific operation. Wow. <clears throat> so my weather briefing was quite interesting because I had to brief at something like 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and so i'd get into work about five and i had to familiarize myself with the whole pacific ocean from arctic to antarctic mm -hmm. and all That's... of the islands and stuff like that because you didn't know when they were going to ask a question right you right. know so you give the general briefing and then somebody would say uh well what's the weather like in uh uh, Taipei, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, if you didn't know where Taipei was, you were in trouble. You know? <laughs> it's a lot of area to, yeah. to have to cover. And then sometimes they'd throw a zinger at you. They, uh, the ballpark in Honolulu, mm -hmm. I forget the name of the street was on, one time when I said, any questions? The guy said, yeah, what's the weather going to be tonight at 7 o'clock? And he named me the street. And I says, what? <laughs> and one of the people who was in the room with me says, that's at the ballpark. So then I gave them. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So how was life in, in Hawaii? That's a nice, nice I don't place know what it's like now, but when I was there, Hawaii was a very serious place, but it was also like a, almost like a, Like a resort. Yeah, a, a serious resort. resort. <laughs> but yeah. for the military, you had your regular chores, you know, your duties and stuff that mm -hmm. you did. 
if you were on a ship, I wasn't, I was at the Weather Central, but if you're on a ship, you go in and out. But when you were off duty, you had so many things to choose from there. Mm -hmm. You know, all, all of these resort complexes and, and uh, places where that they'd had all kinds of entertainment, big name entertainment mm -hmm. coming over from the mainland and all of that. So you had all of that, and the, and the military clubs at the time I was there mm -hmm. were all very nice. Okay. So in that sense, of course, the weather is nice, and so it was, it was nice. Couldn't and, be a bad place to live, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, myself and two other guys uh, had a 32-foot boat. Mm -hmm. Wow. And d did you go out in the, the ocean just... Fishing yeah, or anything was, like that? Uh, yeah, it was the submarine base had a sponsored a diving club, and I was part of that club from the submarine base. Mm -hmm. And a person couldn't ask for more accommodation than being sponsored by a submarine base mm -hmm. for a diving club because I mean, that's what they do, you know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so when we wanted to go out on an extended diving tour, for a couple of days, mm -hmm. they let us borrow one of their big boats. And wow, that's cool. We take those out, and we had the facilities there, the training facilities, mm -hmm. and, and so that that was nice. And yes, I did a lot of fishing and diving while I was in Hawaii. So, um, uh, so we're now up to 1960. 1963. Okay. So where did you go after that? After Hawaii? Well. Most people don't understand why, but I went to Asheville, North Carolina. Okay, so tell us about for that. For people who don't know where that is, Asheville, North Carolina is a resort town in the, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in Asheville, there's the world's largest weather collection center there. Really? And at the time, I there was called the National Weather Records Center. Uh -huh. And it was, it was a huge complex there. Mm -hmm. And the Navy and the Air Force had an office there. Mm -hmm. The Navy office, there were seven, seven Navy people there. The Air Force had about 10 or 11 in their office. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was there, what, what I was doing were called uh, climatology studies. Okay. I would get a request for a climatology study for a certain area and then the whole facilities of all of that huge storage complex that they had there and dig out all of the information you could get. And it was just amazing what they have there. I mean, they have weather observations back to the 1600s, 1500s, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, just out of curiosity one day when I was down in their deep bowels of the basement and I was talking with a guy down there. I told him where I was first stationed mm -hmm. on Ponte, was sending out weather observation look. There was <laughs> my own handwriting and everything. There, there, you know, because we had to send these things in once a month. Yeah. And nobody ever knew what happened to them. They ended up at the National Weather Records. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Your, so, your so, work got somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, so you had uh, weather data from all the countries of the world. You did, as we were digging through to get information for an area, you finally got to the point where I couldn't read German or Japanese or that, but there were certain things I knew what they stood for. Right. And so I could find the information I needed in about six or seven different languages by the time I Wow, <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and after Asheville, where did you After go? Asheville, I went on the USS Boxer. And what kind of ship was that? That's uh, one of the old Essex class carriers. Okay. Number four. And it had been converted to uh, I forget what the designation was. But anyhow, it was it was used as a uh, I think it was called LPH. But it had helicopters on it, mm -hmm. and we had a whole contingent of Marines on there, and it was it was an assault ship. It was no longer used as an aircraft carrier. Okay. But it had 
lot of helicopters. A lot of helicopters. <laughs> and uh, when I was on that, I so we made a tour of the Caribbean and that exercise, of course, down there, but mm -hmm. which is really quite an interesting thing to see what what the Marines have to go through to make these landings with the helicopters and mm -hmm. all of that. You know, a lot of people think that there's a, a lot of conflict or abrasion between different branches of the service. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at it that way at all, and most of my friends didn't either. Because you have different groups who are trained to do different things, and they're all part of a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And of course the Marines train different than the Navy. Yeah. Although the Marines and the Navy are one unit. Okay. And the Army and the Air Force, they're, they're different, but they're trained for a different thing. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't expect a, a Navy guy to all of a sudden join an Army group because he wouldn't know what to do no more than you could take a, an Army guy and all of a sudden put him on a ship yeah. and expect him to do the stuff that's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I always look at it as that, you know, you have your job, I have my job, and together we're going to get something done. Yeah. yeah. That's important for people to work well together. Yeah, and while I was on, on the ship, We had come back from our tour of duty mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. And I had a had an eye problem develop mm -hmm. and I was sent to Chelsea, Chelsea Naval Hospital. For the last year when I was in the service, I was at a, at a Navy hospital because of an eye problem. And and so did you get to um to go to any of the islands in the Caribbean? Yeah, I went to, went to most of them. Okay, and, and what was that like? Was, how were the locals well, there? How, <laughs> was, how were you accepted? Most of the time, good. Mm -hmm. However, when we went to Panama, we weren't accepted there very well. Mm -hmm. And while we were in Jamaica, there was a... You know, basically a, a racial fight that occurred between some of the Marines and some of the locals there. And really? Was, you know, it was kind of nasty. Yeah. But uh, basically it was, it was good. It was nice going to all of these mm -hmm. different islands. And while you were down there on a six-month cruise, you'd see most of the places you'd see them twice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Panama was interesting. Uh, Because there were several of us that, that went rode the train across the to the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you have to see both sides of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> went from the Atlantic to the Pacific by mm -hmm. train, and uh, stopped at the canal and watched the locks work and this kind mm -hmm. of thing. So. Yeah. And I know you had mentioned earlier, um, before the interview, about a uh, a hurricane coming through Haiti. Yes. So talk about that. What was what was that like? Okay, the hurricane started off. Of course, most of them started off east of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and it developed very strong. And it came out uh, south of Haiti, then cut across Cuba to come up towards the mainland. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, we stayed south of, of the islands, and. Pretty decent sized hurricane. Mm -hmm. And after it had passed, Haiti was really, you know, really demolished. It was just yeah. really, you know, your picture say, well, it looks like a war zone. Well, a war zone didn't look as bad as this. Really? <laughs> wow. And in fact, I have some pictures of some of it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And on an aircraft carrier, you know, you have full complement of of uh, physicians and nurses and sure. operating rooms and this type of thing. And so we were ordered to offer assistance to them. So mm -hmm. we, our helicopters went from being 
military helicopters to a mercenary <laughs> helicopter yeah. Yeah. going in and picking up and bringing some of the wounded back to the ship and treating mm -hmm. others there. They set up field hospitals and all of this. It was, and some of the pictures I got are not, not too nice to look at, but yeah. pretty, it was pretty rough. Yeah. And, um, and so how long, how long did that, that operation of helping, helping the locals there, how, how long did that take? And oh, probably four or five days, something like that. Okay. Went into Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, mm -hmm. which Navy always refer, refers to as Gitmo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and that's a, that's a beautiful base there. Yeah. You know, making a stop there is a, a, a rest. <laughs> a you know? treat, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, all of the amenities they had there was, mm -hmm. was, was something. And, of course, this was back in, uh, what, 60, six or something mm -hmm. like that. So, it had been quite a change since I was there. So. Yeah, and um, you mentioned Cuba. Um, did, were you still in the service during the the Cuban Missile Crisis? Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about that if you if you're able to. Well, I was in Hawaii at the time. Okay. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, they, you heard the broadcast: all military personnel report to your station immediately. Wow. And. So everybody did, uh -huh. and if I remember correctly, most of the ships went out to sea. You know, so in case of, case in case, in case they were attacked, they weren't going to be sitting ducks like they were in December the seventh. Right. Okay. And uh, but for us, we, we we reported in, and it wasn't anything we'd do, so we were sent back home again. But, mm -hmm. but most of the military, the army. In Marines and Air Force, they were on high alert. They were pretty much on high alert. But yeah. The weather core wasn't. Yeah. See, the, the weather is a twenty-four-seven operation. Sure. No matter where you are. Yeah. The weather offices are open twenty-four-seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's none of this bit of coming in at seven o'clock in the morning, going home at five. Yeah. Well, some people do that, but all of the rest of the hours of the night are taken over by one or two people. Mm -hmm. You know, get kind of lonely sometimes, but yeah, you know, or if you're at a at an air station, you know, you'd have three or four people up all night long. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so um, talk about was there any more um, any more um, places that you went when you were in the service? Well, let's see. <laughs> Made several trips to Alaska. What was that like up there? Certain times of the year is cold. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, the transport ship I was on. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the Army engineers were surveying Alaska at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the transport ship I was on, we would take up. Uh, a whole contingent of army engineers and and their boats and their helicopters and all of this type of thing mm -hmm. and drop them off at various points around Alaska mm -hmm. and then come back in the fall and pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that we we would go into places in Alaska that that most people wouldn't have gone into mm -hmm. normally because you know they were being dropped off at, yeah. at, at coves that had a name but not, not much else. And, yeah. And we were dropped off a couple of the islands. And uh, one place, there are two places I remember quite quite well in Alaska. One was Seward because that was the main place that we stopped off. Mm -hmm. But there was another place that's called Naknek. Okay. <laughs> and that's up in the Bering Sea in this little isolated village up there. And on our ship we had one guy that was his hometown. <laughs> <laughs> and so we pulled in there. And the water was so shallow you couldn't get within about 15 miles of the place. Uh -huh. And so Captain would anchor out and put over a small boat and let him go home for a day. That's cool. <laughs> That's very cool. Can you imagine yeah. in a little isolated town like that? <laughs> yeah. On a ship that comes up. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So, uh, what about after Alaska? Where did where did you go after Alaska? Well, it was as far north in, in Alaska as Nome, mm -hmm. and then down through the islands, and around Seward, Anchorage, all of those places. Okay. Uh, you know, this transport ship I was on, like I said, we basically went back and forth between San Francisco and Japan. Mm -hmm. But we had, uh, I guess they felt sorry for us every once in a while. But about every six months we'd make a trip to Hawaii. Get a little R&R. &R. Yeah, and well, you know, of course you get to sail in some tropical waters, which is nice, instead of across the North Pacific. Yeah. See, when you go to Japan from San Francisco, you head north. You don't go west. Okay. You travel a great circle route, so you go up to see skirt just south of the Aleutian Islands. I know. Down wow. that way. So if you look at a map, it looks like you've made this big arc, but you look at a globe and it's a straight shot. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. funny. So the weather can be pretty nasty up there. So, you know, very cold. We live, sometimes we'd run into snow and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned that um, on one of the ships that you were on, that, that you actually hit an iceberg earlier? Yeah, that was on the transport ship. We were up in the Bering Sea. Uh -huh. And it was in the spring run up there, so there was still a lot of, a lot of ice up there. And the ice was usually about, I would say, two, maybe three feet thick, and so you're just going through it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there was a great big block of ice in that, <laughs> in that regular stuff. Yeah. And we ran smack dab into it and, and made the bow of our ship look like a shark with its mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> and, and talk about what, what did you do with that? Uh, you, obviously you're out in the middle of floating ice. Um. Well, what they did of course was they transferred as much cargo and anchors mm -hmm to the stern of the ship to make the stern go down, which would raise the bow up okay. so that the damaged part was out of the water. And the, the, the uh, damage control people on the ship was able to put a temporary bow on it that wasn't very strong, but it was enough to keep the water out sure. there. You know, use thin, relatively thin metal, probably quarter, maybe three to an inch thick. Mm -hmm and put a patch around the bow and made it back home to San Francisco so we could get it fixed. Wow, they sailed all the way back. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, so um, so after that, what did, what did you do? Where did you go next? Well, actually, I've gone up to the point where I was discharged. Okay. <laughs> because when, when I left the boxing, I was at Chelsea Naval Hospital for the last, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I was undergoing treatment for, for my eye problem, mm -hmm. and uh, I put in for retirement and I got my retirement. I was retired from the Navy for, at well, I was stationed at Chelsea mm -hmm. Naval Hospital. And, and what was that like, um, finally uh, leaving the, the military? What was uh, life like adjusting back to the civilian life? And Well... Uh, it wasn't that bad for me because yeah. of that. in the military, if you're in a military hospital, mm -hmm. you don't just occupy a bed. Okay. You do whatever you're capable of doing. Okay. If you're confined to a wheelchair, you might be the one that rolls around your wheelchair in empty cigarette ashtray. Wow. Okay. Now I was perfectly healthy except yeah. I had an eye problem. Yeah, sure. And so uh, they put me to work in the eye clinic at first mm -hmm. as one of the receptionists. Okay. And after a bit, a couple of doctors there said, well, why don't we utilize him because we could always use somebody. So they were teaching me how to do things and so I was actually helping them wow. seeing patients. Uh, and there was one doctor there that had done his residency at uh, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Okay. And he said, how would you like, like to do this when you retire? Well, let me back up a little bit. I had 
I had planned on going into the, uh, yes. <laughs> My mind just went blank. That's okay. <laughs> You going uh, I, was, I was going to go into the into the National Weather Service. Oh, okay. 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 And while I was stationed in, in Asheville, there were several high-ranking people there mm -hmm. that had given me a good write-up and everything, signed okay. papers for me. And so what I had planned on doing was retiring from the Navy and going right into the Weather Service. Okay. And but while I was at Chelsea, and this doctor said, how would you like to do this when you retire? And I said, how can I do this when I retire? I don't have any training in that. Mm -hmm. He said, the Mass Iron Air Infirmary has a new program over there mm -hmm. that they want to train people to be physician's assistants okay. in ophthalmology, which they had never had before. Okay. And I said, well, sounds pretty interesting. So he took me over to the hospital and I interviewed a person over there and I mm -hmm. said, yes. And so, believe it or not, I... <laughs> I retired from the Navy, and one day, the next day, I was at the hospital. I didn't even, I plan on having a break between the two, <laughs> but one was starting up. Yeah. And it just happened to start until when I, when I retired, so I went directly in that. Mm -hmm. And I spent two years at the uh, hospital to be trained as a physician's assistant. Okay. And so for me to go to civilian life from, from military life was a rather a smooth... Smooth transition. Smooth transition. Probably the most difficult thing mm -hmm. to go from military to civilian life is because it, in the military, when you finally get higher up in rank, you have a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. of things to do, and you, and you make some decisions that when, how things are done and all of this. Sure. And all of a sudden, you're in a place where it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, it's great. <laughs> It's, it's quite a shock. You yeah, know? I'm sure. I'm and, sure. Uh, but I didn't have much problem with it. And I had friends of mine that had a very difficult time. Yeah. You know, when they, when they retired, they, they didn't know what to do. You know, they got yeah. jobs with flipping burgers and this type of thing. Uh -huh. Well, I happened to have this opportunity to go to school mm -hmm. for two years, and the pay was very good. I'm sure. You know. I'm sure. And in fact, the first first job offer, offer I was given, my, the offer was given to me was so much it almost fell out of the chair. Because <laughs> you know, I wasn't used to that type yeah, of money. Yeah. And, and uh, so I did that and, and so the rest of that history is not military anymore, mm -hmm. but I, I went to work for an ophthalmologist and stayed with him for 27 years. And where was that? In Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Very cool. And um, so um, and, and now you're in, in South Carolina. Um, where where else did you go between there? Well, when I retired in Massachusetts, uh -huh. uh, we moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, for about a year and a half. Okay. And that's a lovely country out there, by yeah. the way. Certainly different than the East Coast, but it's a lovely country. Oh yeah. Okay. But I'm from the West Coast, anyhow, so that you know. That you I'm sure you enjoyed that. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, but due to uh, travel back and forth between mm -hmm. New Mexico and South Carolina because my wife's mother mm -hmm. lived here in South Carolina and she was elderly and not doing too well so we were driving back and forth but after about three or four trips from Albuquerque to South Carolina we just said hey this it's not working. Doesn't, doesn't make too much sense. Yeah. Got to the point I just get in my car and I push Greenville, South Carolina, said, if I go to sleep in the car, I'd go here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, wrapping up, um, how would you say that um, the, the military has, has shaped your life? I mean, obviously you've spent a lot of time in the military. What, 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 what do you think are the, the good things and the bad things that you can take away from Well, first it? off, I'm very proud of being in the service. Okay. okay. Uh, I really don't know how to explain that. Yeah. Because there was, there were some bad times. Mm -hmm. Most of it wasn't bad times. Mm -hmm. The majority of it was work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the weather service, it was 
nothing to have a 24-hour day. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, several places I was stationed at, that was our, our watch schedule. 24 hours on and 24 hours off. Wow. Okay. Very intense. And that was done for several reasons. He had the continuity of the weather was going on. Okay. In other words, if I'm really familiar with what the weather's going on, and you're going to come in to relieve me, I, I can't tell you everything's going on out there right. in even an hour or two. Usually we had a six-hour overlap okay. to bring the other person up to speed. Great. And right. So it wasn't unusual to have a 24-hour duty or 30 hours sometimes. Mm -hmm. You'd have 24 hours on and six hours with a new guy that was coming on, so you <laughs> keep him up to date. Yeah. Of course, when you did that, you also had big globs of time off, too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd work a couple of 24-hour shifts and have a couple of days off, yeah. work a couple more shifts and have three days off. So, I mean, the amount of hours you put in was still the same amount. You'd probably put in, well, probably a 60 or 70-hour week, which wow. had great big hunks of time off also, yeah. which made up for that. Yeah. And <clears throat> but because of that, you know, I think that for, I can only speak of the people in the service branch that I was in, mm -hmm. that we got used to doing these hours. Mm -hmm. When I was at an air station, when you're on the 24 hours, you had to be up all the time, flight ops were going on. Mm -hmm. And so if you had one squadron that was doing late flight ops, mm -hmm. Well, they probably the last plane to touch down at midnight. And then the next squadron, they said, hey, we're going to have early flight up, so they're going to take off at 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh. <laughs> so you had to be there to brief them. Yeah. And so you, we'd usually have a bunker. You'd go lay down for several hours. But if there weren't any flight ops for that, mm -hmm. that night, you could get a decent night's sleep. Mm -hmm. But other than that, and as many a time as I was on the, the full 24 hours. Wow. You know, and when it was at the weather centrals, though there are there were almost always twelve on and twelve off. Wow. Yeah. That that part of it. Like I said, there are good times and bad times. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was just plain work. Yeah. You know, when when you're on a ship, like when I was on the on the transport ship, I was the only one on there. So anything that was done on the weather, I had to do it. There was anybody else could do it. Right. Right. You know. And a lot I had, of responsibility. I had, I had to brief the captain two two times a day and mm -hmm. and keep everything up plus taking the weather observations and, and all of yeah. that. And so you didn't somebody said, What are your hours? And, <laughs> all the time. All, all the time, you know. Yeah. So but, but there there were some there most of it was good. Yeah. Good. Some of it was excellent. Yeah. yeah. Definitely a life changing experience, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, some, some of the had some of the times I had in Hawaii were the best times that I had in Hawaii in the service. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else you'd, you'd like to tell us about? Comment on. Um, mm -hmm. Well, ask a question. Maybe it'll, maybe that'll <laughs> stir things up. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, going going forward. Um, you know, how has the military has changed a lot since you were in there? You, you, you've talked about that. Um, uh, you, you specifically mentioned, um, you know, troops coming back. And, and do you think that, that, you know, you mentioned the transition period being put in there. Is, is there anything else that you think it's a, a cultural shift? Anything else that could uh, really help with that? I don't know, but I think one of the things that people have a misconception about the military, mm -hmm. even during World War II, when there was a terrific amount of fighting, mm -hmm. it's only a small percentage of the military ever engaged in fighting. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you've got one man on the front line, you probably got a hundred men supporting that guy to get there. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. People in training, the supply people, and everything you know builds up to a pyramid. And all of a sudden, you got this one guy. Yeah, one guy shooting the gun. You know, one yeah. guy out in front. I mean, it's more than that, but I think yeah. it's uh, don't 
quote me on this. Of course, okay. I'm going to be recorded. <laughs> Don't quote me on this. But I would be surprised if it's more than seven or eight percent of the military mm -hmm. at any one time has ever engaged in fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, because well, when I when I went to Guam, mm -hmm. you know, this country had been preparing to to attack Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to invade J Japan. Sure. And when I got there, I don't know why the island didn't sink. I mean, there were just acres and acres and acres of supplies over there. Yeah. There was one place near where we were stationed at. It was as big as three or four football fields, and there were jeeps just parked. Wow. Bumper to bumper hundreds to bumper on this huge yeah. area. I mean, there were hundreds of them out yeah. there. Okay. You'd go another place and there'd be tanks, there'd be trucks, and, you know, the supplies would be in big boxes stacked up to the top of the world almost, <laughs> you know. And so all of that, all of those people that were doing that, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, they're not in the fighting, but at they the, same time, that, the same time that they were doing that, you had people in Okinawa that were, uh, they were getting, you know, hacked to pieces over there, mm -hmm. you know. You know, well, have you ever seen pictures of, of the Normandy invasion? Mm -hmm. Pictures taken about three days after the invasion of Omaha Beach. Guys are out there playing volleyball. Wow. You know, the supply uh, people bringing stuff in. Yeah. You know, they're playing volleyball. One day goes from... <laughs> from so, yeah. when, when people think of of people being the military and, and everybody, people ask me all the time, well, where did you see action? Mm -hmm. uh, in front of a map. <laughs> <laughs> you were the guy behind the scenes making, oh, yeah. making sure that everyone that was uh, on the front line uh, yeah. could, could do their job. You, you helped uh, get them there and make sure that they were uh, good to go. Yeah. Over Hawaii, they have the world's largest store. They have a store over there that uh -huh. supplies, at the time I was there, uh -huh. that supplies the military throughout the whole Pacific. Wow. It's got to be a lot of, a lot and, of stuff there. That, just a huge, huge place, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to have hundreds of people there, you know? Yeah. And you know, they're all in the military. And like me, I've got a World War II victory medal. Uh -huh. I, I saw Japanese shot. I didn't shoot them, but I saw them. I heard them being shot at when mm -hmm. I was over in Guam. There was one time when our, where our barracks was, Quonset Hut. I don't know if you know what a Quonset Hut is. Hey, explain that to us. A Quonset Hut is a, that corrugated metal half moon, okay. long building. Okay. Okay. Actually, they're quite sturdy and quite comfortable. Mm -hmm. But uh, where we were, there was a frontage road, and then our huts were there, and on the other side of the road was what we call the boondocks. It was the, the jungle in Guam. Okay. And, and uh, even while I was there, they had uh, Japanese soldiers that were prisoners of war, mm -hmm. and they had them out there doing work. And so we're standing there watching because Wow, that's a Japanese. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, yeah. There's one of them. <laughs> and, and two of them also decided to make a break for it. Fine. Okay. And so the guy that was there, he just took his gun and like that. Didn't pay any attention to it. Wow. Cut him down, and the rest of them kept on working. And I said, what? <laughs> just it's so casual. You know? Just an entirely different. Yeah. Uh, but during that, at night you could hear them firing, fighting at night. Yeah. When I was on Guam. I had a friend of mine that, when I went to the went to the Carolyn Islands, he also went to the Carolyn Carolyn Islands okay. to open up a weather station. He did it. I think it was on Yap. Okay. And so he's out <laughs> with his camera taking pictures. Okay. So he's walking around in flip-flops and shorts sure. and a camera. Sure. Okay. All of a sudden he hears a noise and he looks up and there was two Japanese soldiers there 
fully dressed with arms. Wow. And he looked at them, and they held up a gun out to him. <laughs> they wanted to surrender. Wow. Okay. So he took it, and he marched back in the camp. Here's this guy in shorts and a camera. <laughs> The two Japanese. Took him down with a camera and didn't even have to fire it. That's funny. Yeah. So that, that type of thing was still going on. Yeah. Because those, those island boondocks are, they are really a tangled mess. I mean, you could, mm -hmm. you go in there five feet and hide nobody would ever see you, you know. Yeah. But anyhow, that that's about it. I think that I can say that most of my military life was was nice. There were a couple of things sometimes that were kind of rough. Difficult, yeah. You know, but most of it was good. And, and I don't know if I can attribute that because of the because of the branch of the service I was in. I don't know. But. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your service, Mr. Phillips. So, huh? for so. So appreciative. We, you know, words can't describe, uh, you know, what you've done for this country. Well, thank. You. Well, I will tell you one thing. Yeah. The civilian attitude mm -hmm. has really changed towards the military. Okay. Up until probably about nineteen, say about the mid nineteen fifties. If you were in uniform, you walked into a bar, it was very difficult to buy a drink. Really? Because everybody would want to buy you one. Wow. And then all of a sudden, if you had on a uniform, people would spit at you. Oh, that's terrible. You know, well, there was so, so much hatred that developed during the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. you know, and so people would have a tendency to blame the guy that was in the service mm -hmm. for the problem. He wasn't the problem. Yeah. You know, he was drafted in there and he had to go over there. What is yeah, it? He didn't have a choice. choice. Yeah. You know? And so they're blaming him for it. But like I said, up, up till that time, uh, especially in the, in the late 40s and early 50s, mm -hmm. didn't make a damn story yet. When I was up in Alaska and we went into a bar and in Nome or in Anchorage or in Seward, mm -hmm. people would just you'd walk up and bartender would say, "What do you have?" And you order something. Somebody here, I'll take care of it. Wow, that's yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So the attitude is starting to come back a little bit. There's mm -hmm. because of only, recently I have had several different people, and they said. When I told them I was retired military, they said, well, thank you for your service. Yeah. You, I mean, really, you, you, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, you you really gave a lot to our country, so. You know, but yeah. I, you know it, it, it was a job, and I'm glad I did it because mm -hmm. it gave me a good education. Yeah. It was like I told you, I quit high school in 11th grade to join up like my friends were, uh -huh. you know, but then I got my education when I... I went to probably half a dozen different Navy schools, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so it, it, uh, <laughs> it owes me a lot in one sense, but I owe it a lot in another. Sure. Probably one of the biggest changes is, is the salaries. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, what, what do you think about what, what I was a... Say back in the sixties, my my take home pay was something like four hundred dollars a month or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, which is pretty decent pay. But yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good Lord. And now it's thousands. No, no, no. thousands. <laughs> yeah. I, I was talking with a uh, with a recruiter the other day at the recruiting station out at the mall, mm -hmm. and I said, just out of curiosity, I said. If I was in right now with my time and all that, I said, what would I be making? Oh, about thirty-eight thousand a year. Wow! <laughs> I said, no kidding. He said, no. He said, you'd be really rolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyhow. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, and Anytime. And, and again, all much, all the things that you've done for our country and uh, in ensuring our freedom. So.
Thank you so much. <laughs>